Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The sermon text comes to us this day from the book of Isaiah in chapter 40. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Historically, the context for Isaiah here is prophetic. He is preaching for the sake of those not yet born, of those who are to come, of those who will suffer the conquering of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and the exile into Babylon. Now it might look when that day comes, as if these Babylonian idols, these, these false gods, Marduk, Nebo, have actually defeated Yahweh, have actually defeated the one true almighty God of all creation. Or perhaps that God has abandoned his people Israel when the Babylonians come and conquer. Either way, God's chosen people are going to be tempted to disbelieve, to lose hope in Yahweh. But the truth is, the truth has been and always remains, that God is, yes, both willing and indeed happily able to rescue His beloved people. Even before it happens, God's answer to Israel is, is unwavering faith in His ability, His willingness to keep His promises, to bring them back from Babylon. Isaiah preaches in Jerusalem now a century before this is to happen, but God is preparing them for it because God's people had begun to adopt the ways of the world, had joined to the Lord Almighty these other false gods from the foreigners, the strangers, the travelers who were coming into this great metropolis of Jerusalem and setting them all side by side. Their unfaithfulness was bringing forth horrible judgment. But it's not because God wanted to spite them that He brings the Babylonians to their door. He does this to, to call them to repentance. If we remember after the Exodus, when the people were going to be brought to this promised land, how long did it take them? Where did they wander? In the desert, in the wilderness. And why? So that God would form them, would reform them, would give them the model, the structure, the way in which we are to live according to His Word and in His will, to take from them the practices that they had adopted in their time in Egypt and to, and to teach them, and to love them. And it was many hard lessons learned. Well, it's coming again. The people of Israel have adopted all sorts of practices and God is now going to take them back into a desolate place, into the wilderness, not to punish them, but to, to take them away from temptation, to take them out of that context of complacency, to teach them, to mold them, to reform them, to bring them to a place where they have nothing else than to trust in God. They might begin to simply think that He's abandoned them. And God provides that answer to His weakness, to those doubts and weaknesses, to our weakness and our doubts, reminding them from the very beginning that He is their God, that He is the only God. And so He gently chastises them and He warns them. He says, 
Do you not remember what I've been saying to you from the beginning? From the very beginning to Adam and to Eve, right after the fall, that first Gospel of Genesis 3, verse 15. The promise of the Messiah. The seed, that one seed of woman, who will crush the head of the serpent, who will suffer and die in our stead. From the very beginning, he says, I'm going to do this. And he reminds us over and over again, I am the true king of all the kings of the earth. They all fall before me. And of course I'm able to do this for you. And then he encourages them. He says, wait for me. Trust in me. I will give you my strength. For despite how it looks, I have spoken. I am true to my word. I will never abandon you. I already know. I have set in motion already how my promise will be fulfilled. How I will bring you back. Initially, he does this. God does this through Cyrus. He does this through a pagan. But the Lord promised the ultimate deliverance and the Lord fulfills it in His servant. That ultimate servant who gives back double blessing for all iniquity. He does that through the Christ. He answers our weak and our tempted faith He is able, He is willing to rescue us, to preserve us, to protect us. His beloved Israel. His church. So we like Israel, we face temptations to doubt whether God is able or willing to strengthen us. We might look around and see the church, Christianity is under attack. Fewer and fewer people are are even identifying as Christian. They might even be tempted to say, well, I'm, I'm spiritual, I'm religious, but I'm not Christian. Our culture has become hostile to His Word. Of course you can love Jesus. Of course you can follow Him, but you can do it in the privacy of your own home. Get out of my face. I don't want or need to hear about this man, Jesus. It starts to feel a bit like, like maybe we've come to a, another Babylonian captivity. And we're maybe even then tempted to say, well, God needs our help, our, our wisdom to preserve His church, to rescue, to revive this church. And so we think of all sorts of new and creative ways. We look even sometimes to what the world is doing, to, to the false worship. And like Israel, we're tempted to bring that in. So that we might encourage all these, all these other folks to come by. And yet we dilute, we diminish the greatness of our God. And perhaps saddest of all is when we are tempted then to, well, to adopt the culture that's around us. I made the joke that today is the high holy day of American sports, the Super Bowl. And I have no doubt that There are many, many Christians who have today said, I have a lot of work I need to do for the Super Bowl party. I'll hit Costco. Because everyone else is going to be at church. The lines will be short. I can get ready. Or perhaps even, I can worship God in all places and wherever I am. On a mountaintop, on the golf course, in my car. For that is sort of the way of the the spiritual man. And indeed, God is present in all places. But God has created one place where He is present for your good. To serve you. And that's why we don't call this on Sunday worship. Though that is part of what we do. This is the divine service. This is where God is coming to work. To work in you through word and sacrament. To give you His gifts. To be a blessing for you. That when we depart this place, we might be blessings for others. But God has made this place a special place where He does the work. 
where he does the rescue, where he does the service. And our worship is, is simply saying back to him what he has said to us. We are your beloved children. You have rescued and redeemed us. We give you thanks. We give you love. And as you've loved us, we love others. He comforts and strengthens us in his own body and blood, that suffering servant who has paid for our iniquity, who exchanged our weakness for his strength, to lift us up on the wings of eagles. He is indeed able and willing to rescue us from every threat, from every need. Even when we are beset by the things of this world, even when it looks as if he has left us, he does not grow weary, he does not faint. And the promise is ours. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here, hidden in the midst of weakness, in the midst of exile. But then finally, finally, in our home with him forever. For he has said it. He has spoken it. His word and his promise is sure. And it is yours. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.